28th floor for processing. So now I owe you two, said the godfather. You owe us nothing, said O'Brien. But give me your wrists. I got to cuff you before we go into the office. Big Paul spent the night at the Manhattan Correctional Center. The next day was filled with paperwork and technicalities of shuttling back and forth between FBI headquarters and the courthouse, leading up to a bail hearing at 3 p.m. In between the bureaucratic steps, there would be pockets of dead time, and Kearns and O'Brien offered the godfather a choice. He could stay in the cramped and bustling marshal's lockup, or he could hang around with them. How often do I get to schmooze with the FBI? You got a quiet place we can uh, smoke some cigars? With their docile prisoner properly shackled, the agents found a small, empty office. Once safely behind the frosted glass door, they removed the godfather's handcuffs, and he produced three huge coronas from an inside pocket of his jacket. The three men puffed on their cigars, and then the godfather said, Hey, uh, I know you disapprove. That's why we're here, after all, isn't it? So the United States government can make the point that uh, we do not approve of how certain guineas make their living. Okay, fair enough. If I was the United States government, I wouldn't approve either. If I was the government, I'd put my ass in jail for a thousand years. But not because I'm wrong. You see, that's the part I object to. This idea that the law is right, and that's the end of the story. Come on, we're not children here. The law is, how should I put it, a convenience. Or a convenience for some people, and an inconvenience for some other people. Like, take the law that says you can't go into someone else's house. That's convenient for people who have houses. I have a house, so hey, I like that law. But the guy without a house, what's he think of it? Stay out in the rain, schnook. That's what that law means to him. Besides, the law can always change its mind. Like, uh, the law can say you can't go into someone's house unless it's Paul Castellano, and you want to put a bug in it. Andy Kearns flicked a glowing ash into a green metal trash can. But you can't just have people obeying the laws that suit them. Obviously, answered the godfather. But that's exactly what I'm saying. It's a practical question, nothing more. The government wants to put me away as a practical matter. Hey, they can. They got the power. Me, I try not to kid myself. Some people think I'm a big man. Bullshit. What can I do? A few people, maybe I can get them jobs. But they have some trouble, I can help their families. But look at this. His expansive gesture took in the massive courthouse building, the huge marble steps and the vast paved plaza beyond. Now this is power. What's my little bit of influence compared to this? The government decides I'm too much trouble? They can crush me like a cockroach. I understand that. No hard feelings. Is anybody else getting hungry? Kearns and O'Brien realized quite suddenly that they were, and Kearns offered to fetch some lunch from the employee's cafeteria. Cafeteria? That's like being in jail before you go to jail. I could really go for a good corned beef sandwich. From 2nd Avenue Deli? asked O'Brien. Yeah. Do you know? That's my favorite. Mr. Castellano. Paul. Enough of the mister. Paul. We've been studying you for five years. You think we don't know whose corned beef you like? It's the best, said the former butcher. Lean, but not too lean. Iridescent like fish scales. Served on a crusty rye bread with lots of caraway. Kearns and O'Brien caught each other's eyes. Nah, said Andy Kearns' expression. No way, said Joe O'Brien's gaze. It's only five of twelve. The bail hearing is until three. Of course, uh, if you don't have the balls... Taking the godfather to a delicatessen, this was a truly absurd idea. The man was a federal prisoner, the central target of a vastly complex and vastly expensive law enforcement dragnet. It had taken the government half a decade to get him into the courthouse building. Now two FBI agents were going to blithely let him out again to get a sandwich? No, too much could go wrong. We'll take the cuffs off when we get to the car, said O'Brien. Good. I'd have a tough time eating otherwise. Inside the noisy restaurant, the harried-looking maitre d' started to give them a perfunctory hello, then did a double-take. His face bore the terrified expression of someone either looking at a ghost or expecting to be taken hostage. Mr. Castellano, 
Ah, I, I thought you were, uh... I was, the godfather cut in. These are friends of mine, Max. Mr. Currens, Mr. O'Brien. Uh, put us uh, way in the back. And, uh, Max, forget that we were here. Over a mountainous corned beef sandwich, Paul Castellano talked incessantly of his paramour, Gloria. Listen, uh, there's something I want you guys to know. I don't give a damn, but I do. I want you guys to know I was never a womanizer. The occasional encounter, okay, it happens, but I, I was never one to keep a mistress. A laugh if you want, but I love my wife and my kids. And it seemed to me, you cheat. You're just not cheating on the woman. You're cheating on the whole family. That didn't seem right to me. All right, so now you say I'm an old fart, an old hypocrite. My body's all messed up. I got this young girlfriend. I've, I've been a bastard to my poor wife. But it isn't quite that simple. I'm old, yeah, yeah, I'm sick. But desire remains. Maybe it'd be better if it didn't, but it does. And what the hell's a man supposed to do when a desire remains and he simply cannot bring himself to touch his wife ever again? Now, you guys, you are young. I'm sure your wives are pretty, and I hope to God you enjoy each other. And I hope that what happened to me never happens to you. Happened to me in the morning. That's what it always happens, I think. Never at night. But when you first crack an eye, you want to look at the new day and see some hope. You wake up, you look over at your wife, who's still asleep. And you see an old lady. Gray hair, papery skin, loose flesh. You're still fond of her, in a way, maybe uh, even you still love her. And you know she's no older, no more beat up than you are, but you also know that at that moment you will never touch her again. You can't. Touching her would be like uh, making love with death. The godfather wiped his lips on a paper napkin and pushed his plate away from him. Fastidiously, he smoothed his tie. Then, with a harshness that surprised the agents, he called for the waitress to clear away his half-eaten lunch. What, didn't you like it today? She asked him. At five minutes before three, Paul Castellano, flanked by Special Agents Andres Kearns and Joseph F. O'Brien, entered a third-floor hearing room in the federal courthouse in Manhattan. The Honorable Michael Dollinger would be on the bench and the church-like courtroom pews were filled with notables from the world of organized crime, their attorneys, and their families. Tommy Bellotti was there. The loyal Nina Castellano attended, with her daughter Connie, and her three sons, Joe, Phil, and Paul Jr. The godfather greeted them warmly, but with restraint, as he walked slowly down the center aisle toward the long, crowded double rank of defendants' tables. At the swinging gate that separated the spectators' area from that of the principals, Kearns and O'Brien passed the godfather along to the marshals. They felt strangely like they were giving the bride away at a wedding. Castellano took his place next to his attorney, James La Rosa. The hearing lasted two and a half hours and was deathly dull, a droning litany of technicalities, formulas, useless protests, and repeated results. But somehow the proceedings' very dullness served to persuade the mafia bosses of just how much trouble they were in. By the end of the hearing, the members of the Casa Nostra's governing board looked wrung out and depressed. The amounts set for bail were almost irrelevant, though they were the sort of figures that looked good in the papers. For the underbosses, one million dollars was the price of freedom. The family leaders had to shell out up to two million dollars each. Big Paul got the max. He had now plunked four million dollars into the kitty that guaranteed his appearances in court. It was a figure calculated to reinforce the man's sense of honor about facing the music. After the hearing, O'Brien told Tommy Bellotti to move his car to a dead-end alley called Cardinal Hayes Place. O'Brien and Kearns would try to slip the godfather past the horde of reporters and meet Tommy there. O'Brien, Kearns, and Castellano took an elevator to the basement level. They clambered through a storage room in a reeking passageway lined with small dumpsters. Then there was a tunnel, badly lit, its moist walls furry with mold. This led to a half-flight of concrete steps, and the godfather didn't so much climb them as pull himself up the banister. Finally, there was a door that said emergency exit only. Joe O'Brien pushed it open, and an impossibly loud fire bell began to clang. Ten yards away, Tommy Bellotti was standing alongside the idling black Cadillac limousine, holding the door for his master. Fifty yards from the car, a horde of journalists was rounding the corner into the alley. You'll make it if you run! O'Brien hollered over the infernal clanging. Sorry, the godfather yelled back. 
I don't do that. Like a consummate actor, he took just a moment to put himself in character. He straightened his tie. He pushed back his hair. He wiped his sweaty face on his handkerchief and put on an expression of imperial calm. Then, as if he had all the time in the world, he extended a huge, meaty hand toward the two agents. I want you to know that I appreciate the way you've treated me. Kearns and O'Brien could find no words to reply, and the Godfather broke into one of his rare, crooked smiles. So, how many do I owe you now? At last, with a regal gait and not the slightest sign of hurry, he strolled to the car. Tommy Bellotti closed the door behind him just as the forward-most reporters were coming within camera range. He used the mere thread of his elbows to clear himself a path to the driver's door. Paul Castellano looked through the side window at the agents. He nodded at them and offered a gesture that was midway between a wave and a salute. Then, in an instant of slapstick, Tommy Bellotti floored the caddy, and the godfather's face, contorted like that of an astronaut, disappeared as he was thrown backwards against the seat. And that was the last time that Joe O'Brien and Andy Kearns saw the godfather alive. It may be that Delacroix's death rattle and the pronouncement of Big Paul's fate were one. It is also true, however, that Castellano responded to Delacroix's passing with a pair of misjudgments so egregious, so inexplicable, as to raise the possibility that they were in some way suicidal. The Godfather did not attend Delacroix's wake, and in a milieu that places such a huge importance on ceremony, ritual, and tokens of respect, this was a tremendous and seemingly gratuitous insult. Why didn't he go? No one knows. He had troubles of his own, of course. His trial was in progress, his own health was problematical, but still, not to take an hour to visit the corpse of the man who had been his underboss for nine years? Big Paul's second monstrous error was more strictly professional in nature. He unilaterally decided that the new underboss of the Gambino family would be